Hello, I'm Rick Torbett and welcome to Better Basketball. In the explanation that follows, you will find that Read and React not only teaches, but demands spacing along with five player coordination. Keep in mind that these two essential aspects of team offense will translate to your press offense, zone offense, even out of bounds plays. Read and React will allow you to teach the fundamentals of player development while your players are learning to be reactors and decision makers in this offense. This allows you to collapse time frames in practice. And last, your defense will vastly improve by having to defend an offense that has constant movement, good spacing, and multiple actions. Okay, let's get started. I've always wanted to explain what the Read and React is in, in as few words as possible. But as many of you know, that's, that's nearly impossible to do. But I'm going to give it my best shot. If you know nothing about the Read and React, then I'm going to try to crack open the door and let you see how this is engineered. I won't be able to go into the details of it, but enough that you'll get an idea of what it is and more specifically, when you see other people trying to explain this, you'll know whether it is the Read and React or it's not. My goal in creating this system was to have a system that had no plays and yet all the accountability that you would have with plays. I wanted a system where great players could play with not so great players. I wanted everything in the system to cut to the natural instincts of someone who knows how to play and yet be a system that could teach someone who doesn't know how to play how to play. Um, I wanted ultimately this to be as close to pure basketball as possible. Now I had several other goals in building this system. One of them was five player coordination. I, I'm tired of watching two man games and one man games and three man games. I want five players to be coordinated. Uh, I wanted the unscoutability and unpredictability of a motion offense, you know, the ability to take whatever the defense gives. Uh, I, I want to be able to play in any formation. If I want to play five out because I've got five guards, that's what I want. If I need to play three out, two in because I've got two good post players, or maybe that's the only place they can play, I want to be able to do that. And I wanted to be able, with this system, to flow from one attack to another without ever setting things up. I wanted to be able to try this, fail, and try another attack, fail, try another attack, fail, until the defense breaks down and then we score. Just like you have in a, in a continuity offense, like, like flex or something like that. Now that's a pretty tall order uh, to hold myself to, and uh, I want to show you how I got there. I'm going to explain how the Read and React is engineered in terms of decision makers and reactors. In a motion offense, a traditional motion offense, the player who has the ball, I'm not going to talk about, uh, well, they can take what the defense gives and they should be reading the defense. That's not why I called it the read and react. You'll find out in a moment why I did. I'm talking about in a motion offense, when this player decides they're not going to attack and they're going to give up the ball, they're going to pass to a, a teammate here or maybe into the post, at this point, when the ball leaves their fingers, they've got decisions to make, okay? So we could just draw a decision box around this player. This is a decision maker, okay? In a traditional motion offense, okay? You, you pass the ball, as soon as it leaves your fingers, you've got to decide, am I gonna screen away? Am I gonna basket cut? Am I gonna go screen on the ball? Am I gonna go behind the ball and get the ball? Am I gonna go post up? Am I just gonna stay there or maybe space away? Bunch of decisions to make. And in a traditional motion offense, very elementary uh, example, these players also have decisions to make. You've got five decision makers out there. And it's very tough to keep five player coordination when doing that. So here's what I did. I took the decision box away from the passer and I moved it in here. This is the read and react decision box. And it includes all the way to the short corner, mid post, high post, 
these spots just outside the lane. I removed the decision box from the passer and put it in the lane and left this player with no decision. Okay, when this player passes, this player must basket cut. No decision. Okay, you got one thing to do, and that's to try to get the ball back on a basket cut. Okay, but look where that's landed you. That's landed you in the decision box. In other words, I took the decision box away from the passer and I, get, I give those decisions back to that player in here. If you want to make some decisions to affect the next scoring opportunity, get your feet in the lane because in here you can choose the next best action. Now, I'm not going to go into those details because that's, you know, layers 7 through 16 in the read and react. Uh, those are dedicated to teaching this player what is your next best action, uh, a list that you can choose from. Um, some players will not make a decision. They'll get in here and fill out and hop right back into automatic uh, basketball in the reading react. So the first thing I did was I took the decision box away from the passer and also away from all of these other players without the ball. Let me start back up here. The player with the ball in the read and react is a decision maker. The players on the perimeter without the ball are not decision makers. They are reactors, okay? They get to react with one and only one reaction to every action the ball takes, and the read and react tells them exactly what to do. No thinking involved. This is not decision making on the parts of these players. They here, Here's where the, the name read and react came from. These players read the ball handler and react with one and only one pre-drilled, um, pre-prescribed by the read and react system reaction okay now that way i can maintain five player coordination now you might ask well where's the variability where's the unpredictability where's the unscoutability of this if these players have been pre-programmed to react with one and only one reaction well the defense doesn't know what action the ball handler is going to take that's what's unpredictable now, everybody that knows the reading rack knows what these players are going to do the moment the ball does something, but we don't know what the ball is going to do. Only the ball handler knows. Okay, so that's one unpredictable, unscoutable part in terms of the defense of the reading react. We don't know what this ball handler is going to do. And neither, let's, let's say that this, this player decides they're not going to attack. They pass the ball. They don't want to make any more decisions. And so they make their basket cut. we got to fill. we got to fill. Guess what? This player can now make decisions again. He gave up. He or she gave up their ability to make decisions with the ball. But they'll pick up the ability to make decisions without the ball when they get their feet in the lane. Now, some players are really good at making decisions with the ball. I want them making decisions with the ball. And, and in the read and react, when they do, they move all five players, all ten players, really, the defense as well. I mean, this player can be an orchestrator, okay? This player with the ball knows exactly where all of his or her teammates are going to go the moment they do anything with the ball. It's like they've, they've got telepathy, okay? They know ahead of time. Defense doesn't know because the defense doesn't know what action the ball handler is going to choose. Now, back to this player. This player now, uh, maybe they're not so great with the ball making decisions. So they give it up. They make a scoring cut. They don't get the ball. Now they get to make a decision without the ball. And maybe they're very good at making decisions without the ball. Uh, uh, get your feet in the lane and hey, you can stay in here and post up anywhere you want to post up. You can back screen your way out. You can set a pen screen. You can fill out blah, blah, blah. This is the, these are the layers of the read and react. 
And the difference between read and react and, and many motion offenses uh, is I give these decisions back to the player a piece at a time. As their basketball IQ gets bigger, then I'll add more decisions in their file. Some players will never make decisions. That's okay. They'll fill out, they'll hop right back in and be a reactor, okay? But there's some players who have a big basketball IQ and can understand the game, and I want to fill their intellectual cup with these layers and let them make a next best action decision in here. That gives me two, two decision makers in this case, and three reactors, okay? This player is choosing the next best action with the ball. This player is choosing the next best action without the ball. But these reactors are required, not requested, required to be on our spots and to react accordingly, okay? Uh, they have no decisions to make, and that allows me to maintain spacing, to, to maintain um, five-player coordination. Uh, it allows me to uh, play a, a, a great player with a not-so-great player, a player that's still learning. If you understand what I've said so far, then you'll know why one team is running the read and react and other teams are running some pseudo version of read and react. Here's what I mean. If you hear a coach say, well, this player, when they pass, this player doesn't have to cut. This player, I'm letting them decide whether to cut or not. Or I'm giving this player an extra decision that they can do. They can, uh, they can screen away if they want to. Rest assured, it's not the read and react. Maybe they should call it something else, but it's not the read and react. They don't understand how the read and react is engineered. If you don't have this player cutting to the basket, they never get in here and make a decision. I don't have that constant flow of possible next best action uh, decisions being made. And in the read and react, every time the ball moves, someone is being sent into the decision box. As, as an example, if this player dribbles at this player, this player has no decision to make, it's a reaction. This, this one reaction that we drilled is, this player must basket cut. That player must fill, okay? Okay, so we failed. It wasn't open. We didn't score there. What now? Well, we've sent someone into the decision box. Now, they might just fill out and hop right back into reaction mode, okay? But we have at least a chance of another decision being made here. Now, every time, let's say this player fills out, and let's say this player passes the ball. This player has to basket cut. Oh, another possible decision here that could affect the next scoring action, right? Every time the ball moves in the read and react, it's been engineered to send a player, one, at least one, through the lane into the decision box. Why? Because I want a constant flow of possible next best action decisions being made. Now, some players aren't going to make them. That's fine. Some I don't want to make a decision in there. Uh, but at least I've got a chance of constantly changing the next action, that's unscoutable, okay? Um, and I'm not going to get into the whole idea of a north-south attack and the fact that I'm constantly putting pressure on the rim because of this design. I'm trying to keep with the big picture here. What's different about the read and react? Why don't I allow decisions up here? Why don't I allow this player to not cut or maybe shouldn't cut? because I'll not get a next best action decision by a player without the ball if they don't cut. So that's why it's engineered that way. I'm gonna move back to a five out, uh, even though we can play four out, one in, three out, two in, this is just for, just, for this, uh, uh, just for this clinic. The next major engineering point that I wanna make in this big picture is these spots. 
they're there for a reason not just for training okay now they do make for great training you know and great accountability and security for players if i'm here i'm safe i know i've done what what i'm supposed to do but the real reason for these spots is if i could start every action on a spot train these players to start every action on a spot and in that action on some other spot then all basketball actions could be linked together in any order there's my unpredictability uh, and yet these players are doing them one simple action at a time now when you put them together in a row boom 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 two or three in a row in a in a easy flow it just looks like the players are playing but everybody who knows the reading rack could tell you exactly where every player is supposed to go on every action it's just i can't tell you what action is being chosen or in what order so i've got four reactors okay let me give you an example with this i've got four reactors let's say there's a defender on the ball here and this and the ball handler decides to drive left okay now our layer four says everybody on the perimeter you don't have a choice here <laughs> could i stay could i come behind the ball no you are a reactor okay you are to move one spot to your left he drove left she drove left everyone else moves one spot to the left that means like this For these players, they've all started. They started this action on the spot. They've ended it on the spot. How simple is that? Okay. Let's say this player didn't like what he or she sees. You know, they, they couldn't pass it. They really didn't engage two defenders. There was nothing there. And so they just, they drive and they just bounce off. Well, they're right back on spots. We started it. We failed. Defense won. Kudos to you, defense we're going to attack again okay let's say i dribble at this player and this player basket cuts of course they have to there's no decision there they're a reactor this player fills this player fills oh darn i thought i was getting a rear cut a back door we failed the defense won on that one can we keep on playing or do we have to set it up no what if this player decides in the decision box now to post up can we play from here? Can we keep going without setting it up? Of course. Why? Because we started on a spot and we've ended on a spot. That action's over with and everyone's on a spot. From here, the ball handler can choose anything and the players have been drilled to react with one and only one reaction that lands them on another spot. And you can just link those together. That's what your practice, that's what your repetition is all about, is first, one single action. Then, let's start putting two together, and let's start putting three together. And the, the better the team gets, the more of these they can just link together in a constant flow. Let's say this player feeds the post. This player has no decisions to make, initially. No decisions to make. I just passed, I must basket cut, either this way or this way, okay? And this player fills, this player fills, this player's in the decision box and can fill out anywhere they want to. Now, this player can also back screen their way out and take anybody's place and send someone else into the decision box. But let's not get too complicated right now, okay? Look. We fed the post, we made our scoring cut, it wasn't open, the post didn't score off it. We started on spots and we've ended on spots. That's three actions in a row, boom, boom, boom. Now that looks complex, okay? When it's put together in a nice flow. But from the player standpoint, put yourself in the player's position. This is one reaction at a time. Uh, I start on this spot. Oh, that's what the ball does. I've been drilled to do this. I do it. I'm on this spot. Now what's next? Ball does this. I do this. I'm on this spot. The players do not have to know the big picture. This is much like defense. You teach defense, hey, when you're um, 
when playing defense right here, when you're uh, playing defense on this player, when you're one pass away, hey, you're going to deny. Any decisions to make there? No. No. One pass away, I want a reaction from you. And that's to be in the gap or be denying whatever it is you teach. If I'm um, two passes away from the ball, let's say you're teaching help defense and you want them on the midline, ball you man. Any decisions there? No, you don't want a decision. You want a reaction. Get there. Get that position. Okay? Now, when the ball moves, oh, the ball, we're reading the ball and reacting with one and only one reaction? Yes. I kind of pattern this after the same way we teach man-to-man -man defense. This player moves back here to their denial position because they're one pass away. Uh, you've got a specific way to guard the post, depending on where the ball is. Do you want any thinking there? Not initially, not in the initial stages. Only when you start double teaming and rotate. That's when you've got decision making going on. So I want it just like defense has an elementary reaction level to it. And as you get deeper into defense, then you get into decision making. In the same sense, read and react is designed with this, everyone on the perimeter being a reactor, non-thinking reaction, and decisions are made as you, the coach, determine the basketball IQ, the skills and abilities of your players, you can start doling out these possible decisions that the players can make when they get their feet in our decision box. Same way with the ball handler. You, as a coach, might even limit what you want them to do because maybe they're not great at decision. Maybe you give them two decisions to make with the ball. Hey, you can either uh, dribble at or you can pass, but that's it. I don't want you driving. That's coaching. Hopefully, those two aspects will give you an idea of why certain parts of the Read and React are so strict and whereas other parts, it looks very loose. It's like, uh, wow, they're just playing basketball. Yeah, they are. Uh, those people making decisions with the ball and those in the decision box, yeah. There's unscoutable, unpredictable things going on there that, that, that makes this a, a beautiful and fun game. One last thing before we leave this idea of spots and starting an action on a spot and ending on a spot. What if a player screws up? If a player screws up in a set play, the whole play, you got to reset it, okay? Uh, if someone messes up in the read and react, all they have to do is, all they have to do, that player screwed up for some reason. All they got to do is hop on a spot and they can catch the next action and be right back in into the flow of things. Or they can just hop on that spot and get right back into the action. Read the ball, react, boom, I'm right back in with the other four players. So the read and react has that ability to absorb mistakes without setting things back up. Now, let me summarize the read and react. Big picture stuff here. Read and react is what to do with the ball. What you do without the ball. It has no, it, I haven't said anything about how to do it. How to do these things. How to drive. How to pass and cut. How to post up. How to set a screen. That's player development stuff. The how is player development stuff. So... The re react is what to do. Player development is how you do it. Coaching is who you do it with. How do you operate the system? What's the best formation? What's the best actions to emphasize? Now, I have lots of help for you in all three areas. Along with the read and react, I have the reaction drills video, over 60 drills to help link these actions together, planning the read and react practice, five different practice plans under the title of clinics, player development. I have shooting, ball handling, one-on-one, -on -one, post play, scoring without the ball, passing, and free throws. 
how to operate the read and react the who part variations quick hitters zone attack if you're looking for an edge that can make a difference make the shift to read and react go to betterbasketball.com and get started